Good evening all, and thanks for joining tonight's TI Technology Webinar hosted by Texas Instruments Australia. We are really excited to bring you this evening VTE Mathematical Methods with Craig Brown and Frank Moyer. My name is John Bayman and I am your host for this event. I teach mathematics to Year 7 to 12 students at Lachlan Catholic College Darwin, where I use TI technology to help students make stronger connections in their understanding of mathematics. I'm excited to introduce our first panelist for this evening, Mr. Craig Brown. Good evening, Craig. Good evening, everyone. As you can see, Craig is an experienced teacher of mathematics with a deep knowledge of using TI technology, which he is always willing to share with others. He also knows how to apl that applies in a classroom context where he has experienced firsthand the benefits to his teaching and the understanding of this to his students using TI technology. Craig, thank you for being with us this evening. No worries. Our second, second panelist for this evening is Mr. Frank Moyer. Good evening, Frank. Good evening. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Frank has a vast experience in teaching mathematics, curriculum development, and sharing his knowledge at national and international conferences. Frank is also passionate about rich tasks and the use of CAS to strengthen and deepen students and teachers' understanding of various mathematical concepts. Likewise, Frank, thank you for joining us. Thank you. I'll now pass the important stuff over to Craig. Thank you very much, sir. John? The focus of my presentation this evening will be to um, show how we can uh, use sliders to um, help us in our teaching from the point of view of using as a teaching tool, but as well as uh, looking at um, perhaps um, considering opening up um, outcome two uh, for our uh, courses in being able to um, start answering open-ended questions and look for patterns in some of the mathematics that we are doing. So my first slide here, as you can see, I've got a function defined here in the maths box, uh, which is root x. On the next page, I've actually set up a slider. Now, well, I've got root x here. The slider is variable a here. Now, if I click on the slider and then use the left or right arrow keys, we can see that, in fact, what the effect of changing the value of a would be. Now, from the point of view of the content that we are teaching, it's a nice, efficient way of uh, getting the, our students to have a look at that translation um, along in the Y axis. Not, there is nothing stopping us, however, in actually changing where that um, transformation uh, might be located in the function. That would be a simple matter of clicking on the function and what I will do is perhaps change that translation into a dilation from the x-axis. <coughs> if I go A times by, and notice I had to actually put the multiplication sign in there, so it would recognise A times by F of X. I press enter now, and then click on my slider and change the relevant value values, we can see the dilating effect. Naturally enough, as we've switched into the negative numbers, we're getting our reflection across the X axis. But then, if we wanted to then explore different functions, that would be a matter of just changing what f of x might be in this window. So I've gone back. I will now change that possibly to x squared and press enter. Then when I click back onto the next screen, we can see now that we have got the relevant changes to that function instead. So the slides are a nice way to illustrate um, some of the effects of these transformations, and it's a matter of just relocating them. We could, in fact, uh, put more than one slider in. So if I was to put a plus K at the end, like so, if I actually press Enter, the calculator is going to ask me, do I want to create a slider for K? In this case, I do. So if I press OK, here's the slider for K. I can now move it, grab it and move it so it's out of the road. When I click off it, I can now just see the effect of now changing K on that. If I need to change the settings of that slider, if I right click, 
highlight it first, highlight the slider, and right click on it, which is control menu on our handheld, I've got these options in changing the settings on this slider. So I might want to minimise the size of it, like so. Or, in fact, if I go to settings instead, I can change the, um, max, the maximum and minimum values and even the step size. So if I change the end of the, end of the value of the step size there of 1, then the slider will increment in changes of 1. Craig, that's a good point, isn't it, that we get so used to using the teacher software um, that sometimes we can do move, movements, especially when we're showing students, and, and they can forget, they, they don't realise that our right click with the mouse is actually, like you said, the control menu button. That's right, John, I do it myself all the time. So you, um, in doing this, we've always got to be mindful that our students, generally speaking, are using the handheld technology, so we've got to try and follow those instructions as much as possible. Um, on that note page there, as you can see, um, we noted the automatic prompt when I wanted to enter in the slider, but we can actually also uh, enter a, um, a slider or um, into our function by going through the menu sequence instead. So if we go in, I enter another one, x squared uh, plus k, or double colour for double K, it's going to ask me for the slider again. I might not actually, I might click off it and not do it. For some reason it'll come up. What I can do is if I go through the menu, actions, we have the option down the bottom here to insert sliders here instead. So variable one, I will call it double K. As you can see the settings are in fact the same as before. I press OK, I'm now good to go. So there's a couple of ways of being able to, in fact, enter or um, introduce sliders into our um, pages if we need to. Um, this, enables, this enables us now to uh, perhaps take a slightly different look at um, some of the classic questions we have to uh, look at exploring um, on our courses. The first one is... Uh, I've got a pair of simultaneous equations here where we have to look at values of h where they lead to where would h would lead to getting no solutions, infinite solutions or a unique solution. So that is a matter of opening up a graphs page. And as you can see, I've um, entered the functions accordingly where I've got my slide for h. You might want to uh, take note how that's actually been uh, typed in as relations. We're not sure how to do that. That is just simply a matter of um, opening up a graphs page, right-clicking in the entry bar, and then changing into relation format like so. And then we can just type in 2x plus h equals oh, plus h times by y equals 5, something like that, press enter. Again, I get the um, uh, prompt if I want to actually create a slide or not, I press OK and there we have it. So that's how we can actually change our calculator so we can enter functions in that form. I'll go back over my slide. Now as you can see at the moment the way the slide is set up here, we've in fact got h equals 0 and I've got a unique solution. And so now if we click on the slide and start having a play, we can see that OK H equals 1, we've still got a unique solution. We keep changing our values and hello, all of a sudden we've got a pair of parallel lines. So we've got this case where in fact we've got no solutions. But then we can keep playing, keep changing the values and at some stage, hello, all of a sudden we've got the case where we've got infinite number of solutions instead. So that's it's a nice way of actually visually represent, uh, representing what we're often doing from an algebra point of view. Another classic question would be uh, where we are looking at quadratic equations and looking for no one or two solutions. And so I've got a similar case here. As you can see, I've got a particular quadratic equation um, being graphed. I've got the slider, and then it's a matter of altering the slider, and it's a nice visual, and visual representation of what we mean by no solutions. And so we can see that if I, well, 
I'm going to move that. So if I right click and move, I can move that so I can actually see it. There we go. We can play with our values of M to see, oh, we've got no solutions, no solutions, no solutions, and oh, hello, we've got one solution. It might be not all that, it mightn't be all that clear as to, in fact, what that value might be. There's nothing stopping us pressing menu, analyze graph, and maps looking at the zeros to see if, in fact, a zero is occurring there, which we can see. And which means, of course, if we go now, keep on going to the right, now we've got two solutions. So again, it's a nice visual, re visual representation of what this concept actually means. Alternatively, we could actually set up a notes page, something like this. Um, as you can see, it's basically a, it's a, a basic quadratic page where I've got some notes. These are all uh, maps boxes that are defining the variables. As I say, I've got a Y instead. There's the, um, the function defined in expanded form or standard form. Y intercept calculated, X intercept calculated, turning points, etc. You'll get a copy of this file um, I've made available to you on the website. Um, but I will actually probably take the time to show you that it's sometimes easy to tidy some of this up by hiding some of the input that you don't need. So, for instance, I might right-click on the turning point there, go to Max Box Attributes. Now, remember when I say right-click, I mean Control Menu on the handheld. And if I actually hide the input there, then click off it, the input goes, I'm left with the output. And so there might be aspects of that that we might want to actually play around with so it tidies up the um, format of the page. However, back to the original question, um, if we go back to our values here, it's our A value is 1, B is negative M, and C is 4. So if I change A equals 1, B is negative M, and C equals 1, we now in fact have all these results in terms of that um, variable M. Now, what we'd be interested in actually doing a question like this when we're looking at the solutions of uh, values of M where you have no solutions, one solution, or two solutions, of course, is the discriminant test. So I've got the discriminant down here, and now we have, in fact, the discriminant in terms of M. And then we can look at actually solving that from the point of view of finding one solution, no solutions, or, in fact, two solutions. So that's perhaps an alternative way. It's way interesting, it. isn't it? That, um, and so I think several people used to think, didn't really understand the, map, uh, the point of the notes page. Um, but you can see here how powerful and useful it actually is. Yeah, especially if you use the map change, off. everything sort of updates. I would even take it from using this from the point of view, particularly if kids are struggling what to do next, is there anything stopping us actually graphing a graph of the discriminant versus M? Because the, the A value is 1, B is 0, C is 4. So if we turn around and enter those values in, A is 1, B is 0, C is negative 4, then what we could do is there's the graph page of that discriminant value versus n. So we can quite clearly see that we have, um, when the discriminant is negative, these are the values of m that have no solution. These are the values of m that have one solution. Discriminant is positive up here and here, so they're the values of m that have two solutions. So it's an alternative way of perhaps looking at it and using the technology to help us along at the same time. Part of the course also asks us to, uh, particularly in uh, Unit 3 and 4, look at um, power functions in, the power, in terms of x to the power of n. And so, as you can see on this uh, problem here, I've got f of x defined as x to the power of n at the moment, and I've got a slider down here that is in fact varying the power. And so we can fl start clicking through this to see, have a look at, well, if we change n from even to odd, back to even, back to odd, you can start perhaps uh, discussing with students what they're actually observing, maybe seeing some patterns. From there, we can naturally enough perhaps change the power of n up here to the power of maybe 1 
on end. So now if I press enter, we can now start playing with values of n to see if in fact what we might be able to include in terms of some general shapes. Again, depending if n is even or odd. Now it's probably here, I probably need to mention that um, at this time of the year some of our specialist math students uh, might in fact be doing um, complex numbers and there's a setting on the calculator that we need to be aware of that can send this a little bit astray. If I go up into my settings, uh, click on the battery symbol, go to document settings and have a look at real or complex, some of our students might in fact maybe, if they're doing specialist maths, have rectangular mode highlighted instead. So if I press OK, all of a sudden we don't actually see the graph that we're expecting to see. Well, at least, at least the teachers will be expecting to see something different. And so if those students are doing specialist maths, they would want to be aware that they probably need to change that mode. So I'll change that mode back. So document settings again, back to real and we make the fold, press OK, and we're back to what we are expecting to see. So again, it's a nice, not powerful teaching tool. I would consider this a teaching tool where we can effectively either um, summarise or in fact introduce topics where some of the basic ideas that students in fact need to be able to get their heads around in their understanding. From here now we can start looking at, well, um, as I said earlier, opening up possibilities for outcome two in terms of uh, exploring patterns and so let's looking at looking at higher order polynomials and that is part of the study design looking at high order polynomials. So if I if we look at the function that I've defined here, a fairly simple one, where it's a polynomial to the power of M and N, then what we can start doing is asking our students to perhaps play with the powers accordingly to see what sort of stationary uh, um, uh, what sort of stationary points etc are occurring at the intercepts and so if we turn around and start playing we can see we can see that the odd and even powers are naturally um, producing different types of um, features at the different intercepts then of course what we could do then is turn around and change the function. We might decide to introduce another factor into the function. Be nothing stopping then actually even putting another power there, going back to our graphing page and then uh, having another play with our sliders to observe some of the patterns. And of course part of maths would be you'd want to be teaching, well, if, depending on the power, what sort of, uh, what would the order of the polynomial be, or the degree of the polynomial, I should say, be. Moving on from there, part of the course needs to, needs us to consider transformations of points as described by um, functions. Created a notes page here where in fact I can define a function. And here are all the uh, relevant transformations of a function. And down the bottom here is the result. Now, if I actually click on that, you can see, in fact, there are all the transformations there hidden away, like I showed earlier on in the presentation. If I click off it, there's the result. Now, at the moment, I have not actually done anything to the function. However, if I, now start, if I want to reflect uh, in the x-axis, as the instructions say, say here, all I need to do is enter in a negative 1. If I press enter now, we can see the result down here with the transform function. I consider this, again, as a teaching tool where we naturally expect the, uh, our students to be able to do this from a, in a tech-free setting, but in terms of standing in front of the class we can, um, and, and teaching the concepts, we can actually start playing around with some of these uh, transformations and get to the point where we try and have the students predict what they think might happen. So if we then turn around and put this relevant translation in here and then go downstairs to have a look, we can see in fact that those are uh, translated um, along the x-axis accordingly. Now we, I must 
rapidly running out of time in this presentation, so I'll just glance over the polynomial algebra uh, pages I've got here. Uh, as you can see, I've actually opened up another um, another notes page where I've just opened some math boxes and defined some polynomials and show, showing some of the mathematics that we can do with polynomials. But you'll notice down the bottom here, I've actually got a poly coefficients. Uh, command where it's actually showing the coefficients of p of x. So if I go pick up the p of x, we can see the coefficients of p of x is 1, negative 3, 1 and 1. And so downstairs here, there they are. Some would say, oh, perhaps big deal about that. But we can actually use that to our advantage when it comes to, again, teaching the idea of equivalent polynomials. And so what I've got here although my screen's gone a bit strange, so if I go back over the left, there we go. If we consider the classic question where we have a left hand and a polynomial expanded on one side of an equation and the equivalent polynomial in some other form, then the idea would be to uh, expand or expand perhaps the, this side here, this polynomial here, and equate coefficients. And what you can see is what I've done here is uh, set up the page so it shows us the, co the coefficients of this polynomial, shows us the coefficients of the right hand polynomial. You'll notice it's actually expanded it and showed the coefficients. In this math box here I've got the poly, co poly coefficients of the left polynomial equaling the right polynomial. And as you can see it's actually setting up the equations that you'd expect to be defined by hand. Lastly I've actually set up this list called coefficients and by setting up the list, that allows me then to actually solve each of those elements in terms of simultaneous equations. Each of these brackets here, just this is saying get the second element of this list. So the second element would be this element here, which is that equation. This is the third element, which is this equation here. So as you can see, I've selected those elements and solved them simultaneously. And just like all the notes pages, if we make some sort of change, if I change that to and perhaps and press enter, as you can see, automatically updates and we have the relevant solutions down the bottom here. That was a little bit rushed, but I would like to actually spend the last part of my presentation talking about widgets. Uh, in the um, latest operating system update, we've got this option of uh, using widgets, and so I've been having a little play around with them. First of all, I'll show you what a widget is. So if I go to some, uh, open up a, um, a document, uh, the one I opened up earlier, so I'll insert a new problem. If I go to a notes page, I'll define some sort of function, f of x is assigned to x squared minus 4. Now I might be doing some maths with this, so let's maybe find solve an equation using it, so solve f of x equals uh, 8 comma x and close the brackets, press enter. As you can see we're doing some maths with the question. Now maybe uh, all of a sudden the question is asking me to um, transform that in some way or another. Now what I've actually done is actually created a widget using this uh, transformation page that I've shown earlier. So if I turn around and go insert a widget, I've got a number of widgets here, but if I just scroll down we'll find the transformations widget here. So I press add. And what this does is actually add the page that it looks similar to what I was working up working with before. Now I've called fw the function that's within the widget. Now I've actually defined f of x as x squared minus 4. So if I just type in f of x, that's just going to relate the fact that f of x is x squared minus 4. Now all I have to do is just activate, click on activate all these. Now if I go down to the bottom and press enter, there's x squared minus 4. And now with that function that the question started off with, I can now start um, trans, uh, transforming it. So maybe I want to dilate that by a factor of 2 
from the x-axis. So if I put a 2 there and press enter, let's go downstairs and have a look. There we are, as you can see, the whole function is being multiplied by 2. Now we might want to expand that, but I must admit I actually quite like that form because that's actually showing that to um, dilate that function um, in or from the x-axis, the whole function has to be multiplied by the 2. So it's actually, I'd probably for a while encourage the kids to leave that to sort of make that point. So to create a widget, all, we, all you actually have to do is create a file and save it into my widgets. So if I very quickly open up a file, brand new file, notes page, control M, X1 becomes equal to 1, control M, Y1 becomes equal to 1, X2 equal to 4, Y2 becomes equal to 5 will do. I might want to uh, do a simple thing like calculate the gradient. I don't know if it really only when you're doing one for this, but it'll at least illustrate the point. M becomes equal to Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. There's the calculation. I will now save this into My Widgets. As you can see, when you go to Save, you actually save it into a folder called My Widgets. And so I'll call it Widge. You'd obviously use something a bit more sensible than that. I'll hit Save. Now, I'll open up a document. There we are. I will go to New Problem. Open up a Notes page. Let's pretend now I need to access that widget. All I need to do now is go to Insert, open up my widgets, go and find the widget that I need. So there's Widge, and there we have it. And there's what I ended in before. All I have to do now is actually change this to the current problem that I might be doing. So I might change, make that change. I'll activate that. I'll make that change. I won't change that. I won't change that. So to activate them, Greg, you're just clicking on them, then pressing enter. Is that correct? That is correct, and uh, you're good to go. That'll, that's actually for that particular problem there. And that basically brings me to the end of my presentation, ladies and gentlemen. So it's probably time now to hand over to Frank. John? Thank you very much. That was great, Craig. And you can see the real advantages of those widgets that you know, kids can pre prepare things in advance and then um, just run with it. Um, and even as a teacher, you can, can prepare it in advance and then um, you know, send it out as, a, as an email and they can download it or even if you've got access to Navigator. Yeah, and I, I, got I that. think, John, that they'll be useful where I, I can see people setting up perhaps some basic uh, differential calculus and integral calculus ones where we do a lot of that. And so instead of having separate files to answer questions, you can have it as a widget and just insert that information yeah. in as you need it in a particular problem and away you go. Right. Thanks very much, Craig. Now, Frank, we can see your screen and thanks for thanks for showing off. It looked like the Grand Canyon behind you there. Was that correct? <laughs> That's right. Beautiful. I, 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 I think you did that on purpose, just to, just to you know, just to show off a few of your holiday photos. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Craig and John. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to my part of the uh, webinar. Now, what I intend to do tonight uh, is to look at just a couple of the ready-to-use activities that I've made available for download. Uh, you can go back to the um, webinar section of the PI Australia site, and you can download all of the files. Um, now, most of these relate to concept development and investigation. Now, the first one I thought we might look at is um, a simulation. So, the, how does this relate to Unit 1? Well, I've got what it says in the study design. So, it's the use of uh, random generators and pseudo-random generators using technology and display and interpret these results. So, why simulation in uh, Unit 1? Well, simulation, as far as I'm concerned, is the key to students developing a really good understanding of what's going on with the sampling distribution. I think if they don't understand sampling distribution, then they're going to struggle with the inference for, for proportions work and the inference for means work 
uh, in Year 12 uh, Methods uh, Specialist. Okay, so I'm going to have a look at this activity, which is, um, I guess, inspired by one of the Advice for Teachers activities that are on the BCAA website, uh, except uh, I've just changed it a little bit. So this is the scenario that we're going to simulate. So player A and player B each have 12 picture cards. Um, the player simultaneously reveal the top card of their shuffle packs and they note whether the cards are a matching pair. So these cards are put aside and they repeat the procedure until they've all been compared. So we're going to use simulation to explore the distribution of the number of matching cards. And the beauty of simulation is that we can do this not just once, we can do this a hundred times, a thousand times, or whatever. Also, this problem is mathematically identical to, I guess, a more interesting problem, which I can now reveal, uh, thanks to Warren Beatty. So the Academy Awards mix-up. So let's suppose that you had uh, the names of 12 award recipients and you had um, these printed on cards and you had 12 separate envelopes that had the, uh, the title of the award. So let's suppose that we randomly took a name card and put it in an envelope. Uh, can we use simulation to estimate the proportion of times that everyone would end up with uh, the wrong award or that exactly one person would end up with the right award and so on. So using simulation we can look at this. Now this is a classic derangement problem. So a derangement is a permutation where uh, the n objects, none of the objects end up in their original or intended position. Now when you start with year 11 students, they've all got their brand new, or many of them have brand new calculators that have never been used, so they've got the factory default setting. Now, the calculator does not produce true random numbers. They are pseudo-random numbers that are generated using an algorithm. So if they all have the same factory settings, they will all get the same answer. So it's very important that we go to catalogue, which is the symbol here, except for can't do it quite at the moment. Um, let's go back. Okay, now I'm stuck there, am I? Okay, let's move. Okay, so uh, it's important that they go to random C and put in, say, the last four digits of their phone number, and now uh, students should all get different numbers when uh, they start to do random sampling. So what we're going to do first of all is label the cards 1 to 12. So what I've done is I've used a, a maths box, which um, Craig has already spoken about, and here uh, I've used a sequence command to label the cards. Now I've got, a little back, I've got a little program in the background which allows me to capture the values that I generate from the random sample. Now, the calculator does have an inbuilt um, data capture command, but that doesn't really work very well with statistics. With simulations like this, uh, there are some problems with it. If you get, say, three zeros in a row, it will only record them once. So I've done a very simple program um, to capture the data. Okay, I'll repeat it many times and record the results. All right, so can you see 1.6 is yet, John? I certainly can. I can see your spreadsheet. Yep, it's all cruising along okay. nicely. You uh, obviously paid your bills this month, Frank. Thank I you. Must. Okay, uh, we're a bit slow of our internet here. So this can be player A or that can be the name card if you want the Academy Award uh, stuff up scenario. Uh, player B or the envelopes, and here the command that I've got is random sample from the pack. Now pack is what I called my card, so my card num have been numbered 1 to 
well, and I'm collecting a random sum. Now, I've also got this plus G minus G, and we'll see what that is used for in a minute. Obviously, it does nothing if you add a variable, sorry, if you add a value and subtract it, you're adding nothing, but it's there for a purpose we will see in a minute. And I've done the same for this one. So I'm randomly selecting. And over here in this column, I've used a when statement to decide whether that's a matching pair. So that's card number five with card number seven. So obviously, it's not a matching pair. So when A1 equals A2, I record a one to show that it's one match. Otherwise, it's zero. And here, I record the current value. So it's just the sum of column C. And over here, I'm going to capture all of those values. So, so far, I've played the game once and I've lost um, no matches. Now, if I press Control R, then it recalculates. So, this time there was one match. And so, I can see that this column E, I've now got 0 and 1. If I press uh, Control R again, it recalculates. And we can see that we can start populating the spreadsheet. Okay, so already we've played however many games. Now, this is being recorded here on this uh, data and statistics page. Now, there's a few things going on here. I'm using the sliders in a different way to the way that um, Craig was using them. Instead of the, the sliders controlling a parameter, this slider is controlling set and reset. I'll just reset the value. Um, and this one is so that I can select, I can, I can reselect. This is where this value G comes from. So that's what that G is there for. I can't do Control R on this page and get the spreadsheet to recalculate. So by doing plus G minus G and this slider controlling G, it forces a recalculation. The other thing you could, I could have done there is, this is what uh, Peter Flynn did, you watched last night's um, webinar, was use signum G. I could have done that. Signum uh, always returns the value 1 whenever you have a positive value. And this other slider is just a counter. Okay, so this is recalculating. I'm doing the recalculation here. So every time I click, that's the equivalent of um, either playing the card game again or with the um, Academy Award uh, scenario, it's running the Academy Awards another time. So with the Academy Awards, we only get one chance to start up. However, uh, with uh, random sampling using simulation, uh, we can do it over and over again. And now, my internet connection is slow, so I'm up to, I'm almost, I've almost got 100. The nice uh, thing about that, Frank, is that you can see it automatically resizing um, on the, you know, the, the vertical columns. And uh, uh, yes. that's a really nice, it's not just running off the screen, which is really nice. Ah, yes, yes. So that, that works quite well. Yeah. Um, now, if you do 100, over here on this page, so the distribution, zero matches, one match, two match, and so on. And I can have a look at the proportion. So out of those 100 times that I um, ran, uh, that I played the game, or uh, 100 times that I ran the, that I, that I simulated the Academy Awards, um, then I can record those numbers. So, What's going on here is I've just got a count if. Count if uh, what's happening in the matches. So this is just count if. Count if uh, matches is the count number of ones in that column that I call matches. The number of twos, the number of threes, the number of ones. In this column, all I've got is just the proportion. So um, whatever's happening in B1 divided by the total out of 100 so on. So I get the proportion. 
Now, this number here that I've got in red, I wouldn't have that for students. That's there for teachers because that's the theoretical probability. So we can use um, the formula on derangement, which is obviously well beyond um, year 11 or even year 12 level. But that is the theoretical probability, and it's actually not that bad. You know, 0.37 roughly, uh, we got 0.39. Now, when I've done this, when I was playing with this, um, I've actually had proportions as high as almost 0.5 and as low as about 0.15, depending on how many trials. The more trials you run, obviously, the better it works. Okay, not sure what's... Oh, okay. So, I've just talked about the architecture this. I've got to have notes pages. Now, why did I do this in notes page, in notes pages, or why did Craig do his stuff in notes pages rather than calculator pages? Well, the reason is that any computation in a calculator page is static. Once the calculation has been executed, then uh, it gets locked into history, whereas in the notes, in the, in the maths box, in the notes page, everything is dynamic, so everything gets updated. Okay, so if I, for example, hit the reset button, everything gets reset here. You can see that all of those, so I can actually, I can actually run it from here as well. Okay, and that's the other thing, that's something else about sliders. So long as you've got sliders in the same problem, this slider here um, will also control the sliders with the same variable on all the other pages in the problem. Okay. Now, just talk a little bit about the program that's making this all happen. Now, um, unlike John, I'm not a programmer, so how did I learn to write a, a simple program like this? Well, for, for a start, I went to one of John's sessions when he was visiting Melbourne. Uh, and then the other thing I did was go to 10 minutes of code. Now, where do you find 10 minutes of code? If you go to the um, education.ti.com forward slash Australia, you'll see um, that one of the big boxes is 10 minutes of code. So I just went through those and I thought, oh, okay, so I, I can do this. So this is really quite, this is just an if statement to reset. So if the reset one on the slider, then matches is an empty list and I also reset the value of G. G was uh, a dummy variable that was um, allowing us to recalculate from anywhere in the problem and then I, I go back to reset the zero. Now what's going on here? Well this is where, this is what I'm using to do the data capture. If you use the inbuilt data capture, that's fine for geometry. It's problematic here. You'll get the wrong results because it does not um, capture the same value twice until the value has changed. So here I've used, like Peter did last night, I've used the sigma function. Um, I could have done plus g minus g. I've used the sigma function, which just returns one times the augment. So augment is the statement that you use to uh, join two lists together. So I'm joining two lists together and then making that, uh, uh, saving that to match. So in fact, the, um, the whole process becomes iterative. Okay, uh, so this is one I prepared earlier, just in case uh, my internet was really slow, wasn't working, And going to go right in. Okay, so what I'm after is page 4.1. Um, I'm not there yet, so I gather, John. You are on 4.1, yep. See it loud here, like a big summation, blue summation symbol. Ah, beautiful. Okay, so this is the theoretical probability for getting zero matches. So this is the derangement formula. So the derangement formula, the proof is beyond um, year 11 or 12, as I said. 
Uh, and now, why is why do we have negative one in the K? Um, why does it alternate between positive and negative? Well, it's called the inclusion-exclusion principle. Uh, you don't want to include some of the permutations twice. You have to include the next. The proof of that is beyond our students. But this is the interesting thing. If I only have four cards, so for example, um, four envelopes, four recipients of the Academy Awards, I randomly place the names in the envelopes, probability that none of them get the correct award up uh, 0.375. The five doesn't, go, doesn't change much. Six, seven, and so on. And interestingly, it converges very, very quickly. So it's almost independent of the number of cards you have. And if you have a look at this again, you'll realize that this forms a Taylor series. And in fact, it's a Taylor series for e to the negative x, with x equal to 1. So in fact, what that is converging to is e to the negative 1. And of course, a Taylor series converges very quickly. That's why almost in of uh, the number of cards. Okay, so that's an activity that you might like to use. Um, the next activity, no, skip that one. Yep, mixed nuts. Okay, no, so we'll skip the mixed nuts. So in investigating the derivative of y equals a to the nx. Good to go. Good to go, excellent. Okay, so this relates to units three and four, although you can use other functions. Once you've got this template, which you're welcome to download and, and adjust in any way you like, um, then um, you, can, you can change the function and still use the template. Now, when students learn to differentiate something like a cos of nx, they learn that the derivative is a, uh, negative uh, a n sine of n x. Why do you put the n out front? I really don't know. Okay, so and and the limit isn't much of a help because most of the cohort um, limits are far too esoteric. So let's have a look at uh, this template that I've created. There is one that I've already done, but um, if the internet is fast enough, I might be able to show you how to set it up. So what I'm going to do is on the graph, by the way, note that uh, on the later operating systems, you can use exact values. So you can um, just hover over a particular value, um, press enter, enter, and it becomes editable, and you can change that to uh, an exact value. Um, OK, so what I'm going to do is put a tangent on this. Go menu, geometry, points and line, and tangent. Okay, I'll escape out of here, hide this, control menu, hide. And next, I want the coordinates of the point. So you hover or touch the point or hover over it, control menu, and number seven, coordinates and equation. And you've got the coordinates. The other thing I want to do is to measure its gradient. So once again, menu, geometry, eight, measurement, three, and I've got slope, three. So I've got the slope measuring curve. I go to the line. Click on it, lock it in, um, escape out of there, I'll move it out of the way. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, graph or plot the x-coordinate of that point against the gradient. So what I need to do is link this to a variable which I'll call xc, so you can just 
hover over it, control menu, and store number five, and I'll call that XC. So now see that it's now linked to XC. This one I'll link to the variable that I'll call N. So hover over the gradient, control menu, and store number five and M, and that's now stored. Okay, now the other thing I now have to do is set up a spreadsheet. So I've set up a spreadsheet. Just set this to... I've set up a spreadsheet. I've called um, one column Xcoord, and in Xcoord what I'm going to do is capture the value XC. The other column I've called Gradient. In the column Gradient, I'm going to capture M. And this time I have used data capture, the inbuilt data capture. Okay, so um, as I move that point around the graph, uh, I will populate that spreadsheet. Oops, let me go back. So this is one I prepared earlier, like on those cooking shows. And um, the other thing I've done, if I menu, graph entry edit, or as Peter Flynn said yesterday, we should call that um, graphing mode. We want to change the graphing mode to scatterplot 6, and in that scatterplot, what I'm going to do is uh, for X, I want to uh, collect the data that is being, that, that, that populates the X coordinate column, and in the Y, I want one in the gradient column. OK. Escape out of there. So that, that's already set up. Currently, we've got the, the current value of XC, X coordinate, and the current value of gradient. Now, I can actually grab this point. So I can go to the point, control, click, or just hold down the click. I can grab it and move it around. But instead of doing that, I can animate that. Now to animate the point, go to control menu, and it's under attributes, which is not all that intuitive. Now, if you go control menu attributes, then you notice that you've got this attribute down at the bottom there. Now that allows you to change the direction the directional the, the, the speed of the animation. So the default is zero, point is stationary. Um, if you want to change the animation speed, uh, you can just press a number, like two. I'll go a bit faster, so I press two. I now enter and enter again and it's going at speed number two. And you notice that you get this little control over here. Okay, so we'll let that do a spin. It's a great visual though, isn't it, Frank? Really fantastic. Okay. Now, um, we can say, well, what's going on here? Actually, um, speed of one would probably be even better. So I can just go back, attributes, go back down there, one, Enter, enter. So it's doing it again, this time at a slower speed. And now students can then see what's going on. So, okay, so for example, why is this zero? Well, what, what was the tangent doing at that point? Ah, the tangent was horizontal. Ah, why, when the, where the graph is positive, you'll notice that we're above the axis. On the, the red dots are above the axis. When the gradient is negative, they're below the axis. So they can see all of these things. Then they can try and come up with um, the rule that matches that. Uh, and of course, usually they say it's uh, the cos, uh, four cos of um, x plus pi, which is correct. However, we then then that's when we can then use um, 
what Craig was doing, transformations, and see that that's the same as the sign. Okay, so we do the same. We do the same thing, except this time we've used um, the cosine of x on two. With the cosine of x on two, students can see that well, we get something very similar, except it's no now it's no longer as high. So uh, it's only half as high. So why is it half as high? Well, if the period has, if, if, if we stretch this so that it's twice um, as long, then the steepest part of the gradient is only going to be half as much as before. And we can do likewise with 2x. So this time with 2x, they can see that it's twice as big, which makes sense because it's now going to be the steepest point is going to be twice as steep. And this is the last one. Uh, oh, by the way, so that's doing the same thing this time, though. Instead of using the inbuilt capture, I've written my own program uh, to do the capture. And last but not least, my final thing, if I just change that template, all I've done is I've rescaled, I've changed the function to d to the x. If I do the same thing, well, that's interesting. And if students compare the value of m and the value of the y coordinates, they see that, hey, ding, guess what? It's the same. Okay, and hopefully it gives you a better conceptual understanding of what's going on. And I'm out of time. Uh, I've given full instructions in a PDF as to how you can set this up yourself. So by all means, have a play with it. Uh, at your leisure. So that's me done, John. So uh, thank you, everyone, and thank you. That's fantastic. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Frank and Craig, for uh, both an insightful and useful webinar. Uh, I'll just follow on a little bit from what Frank just said. He mentioned uh, TI codes, and uh, thank you for that. Uh, this is the TI, educationti.com website. And this is the Australian page, and you can see there's TI, 10 minutes of codes, the TI codes. We click on that. We can then choose whether we use the TI 84 Plus or the Inspire. And then there's information there for both the students to run without you being the expert and also resources for the teacher as well. So there's plenty for, to access in there. And also, as Frank mentioned, the webinars, so like tonight's webinar, uh, which is currently running here. We can see that, which is where you've obviously been, but if we can go here, so these are the future webinars this term. We also can go to watch past webinars, and there are plenty for you to uh, keep yourselves busy if you ever get bored of an evening, and to go towards your PD hours. And we can see there's two coding ones here back in August, one on the TI Inspire and one on Coding Basics, so another webinars uh, allowing you to, to stop and start them uh, when, you, uh, when you would like. So, to wrap it up, um, when you leave the webinar tonight, um, a brief survey will automatically appear and um, in your browser, and the feedback that you'll get um, will help us plan future online events. Uh, we do we listen to your feedback, so we do hope that you share your thoughts in a post-webinar survey. Your all-important certificate will be emailed to you in the next 48 hours along with the link, as I already mentioned, to the on-demand and also YouTube version of the recording, as well as the relevant documents that both Craig and Frank mentioned. After we leave tonight, if you do need some post-webinar follow-up, feel free to phone or email us. We'd love to hear from you. And sadly, that brings us to the end of tonight's webinar. Uh, thank you so much, Ray. Uh, sorry, <laughs> poor climbing. Thank you so much. Craig and Frank. That's fine. Thank you. We really appreciate you uh, sharing uh, your knowledge and your expertise and, and, and how that's used in the classroom. We really appreciate that. Thank you. And likewise, thank you everyone for, for tuning in um, and we hope to see you back online again soon. Thank you all and have a great night. Good night everyone. Good night. Good night.